the focus of our company is very, very uh, straightforward. And that is we're looking for uh, undiscovered innovations at the world's leading universities that if commercialized can make a positive impact on people's lives as well as produce a good return on invested capital for our shareholders. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, doing it is a lot more difficult than just saying it though. And uh, we've been at it now for a couple of years and we have built four portfolio companies, all of which are showing extremely good progress, all of which are generating revenue, two of which have listed, one on the London uh, uh, Junior Exchange, the AIM market, and, and one on the uh, NASDAQ in the U.S., and a third of which, Microsoft, uh, we're anticipating a listing in H1 of 2023. So uh, the model is working. That's the news from the front. And it's working even in a challenging environment with all the headwinds that everybody knows about and I'm not going to speak to. But what I am really going to speak to is when you're really focused on solving a problem, even in a tough climate, uh, there's a, usually a path forward. And that's what we've found to be the case. Uh, these risk factors are obviously too numerous to cover in this presentation, but our entire presentation is on our website under the investor tab, and you could read it, read the risk factors as well as the other uh, salient points at your leisure. So we're building portfolio companies with university discoveries, and we chose universities because when you deconstruct most disruptive businesses, the technologies usually can be traced back to either a major university or a, a government-funded uh, R&D center like a Los Alamos or a NASA or something like that. And so uh, these are really high-value targets because they employ some of the most gifted people in the world and in various technological spaces, and they're usually quite well-funded over the long term. But our job is to find a technology that, if successful, can really positively impact people's lives. And that's a common denominator across all of our portfolio companies. To do this, we have to build certain skill sets in-house that allow us to screen very nascent early stage technologies for potential diamonds in the rough, as it were. And that skill set turned out to be pretty handy, not just for ourselves, but to the universities that were looking at to source technologies from. And about 250 of those universities have become clients of ours to access our ability to screen their technologies for them. So they know which ones are worth investing in and building a patent estate around. And I guess the most important point financially is that over the last five years, we have built a what I think is a pretty enviable track record of growing um, our net assets, which is our most important KPI. For the first half of uh, 2022, um, we had a uh, record in terms of our net assets. We were just under $77 million. We have no debt. Uh, and uh, that turns out to be around uh, um, uh, 51 cents per share in terms of our net asset value which obviously our stock price is, is less than that. So we're trading actually at a discount to our net assets, two of which are shares in listed companies. Our total revenue for the first half of the year was $8 million. And our, our net income after tax was $6.7 million. So we run a very lean operation. It's a small, albeit in our view, knowledgeable headcount that knows how to get the job done. But again, the most important metric uh, is the, uh, the growth of the net assets over time. That's where the rubber meets the road. And of course, there's no guarantee the net assets will increase from period to period, but that, that's always our, our objective. If you're looking for uh, a needle in a haystack, which we are when we're looking for university discoveries, it behooves you to have a very large haystack and also a good sifting mechanism. So we built a very large A-stack. We have um, upwards of 4,500 research institutions that we're sourcing innovations from electronically. Uh, and they sp they're spread out over about 160 countries. And you really need that sort of breadth 
if you want to find the most promising opportunities in our view. But that alone is not sufficient. You have to be able to do deep, a deep dive on the due diligence to assess the, uh, the scientific veracity of the technologies. And we have approximately 60 science advisors under contract to us that help us do that. And that also is not sufficient. You then need to determine the market potential of this early stage technologies, even if you've confirmed that the science is sensible or, or perhaps even, you know, sagacious, can it be converted into a, a sellable cost-effective product or service? And we originally started using a service to help us make that determination called Invention Evaluator, which was built by a, a very capable scientist named Dr. Mannion, Michael Mannion in, in Australia. And after using the, the service so many times, we realized that it, we really should own, own the service and we bought that company. And, and we use that service for all of our screening operations. And we also provide that service to you know, several hundred universities. We also provide it to a couple of very large corporates like Hewlett Packard Enterprises, et cetera, to help them screen their own R&D output. Suffice it to say, with that process in place, uh, we were able to produce four startup companies, which we started all from a clean piece of paper. We incorporated them. We acquired the initial technology. We acquired the initial either board director or CEO, we put in the first few million dollars. We really built them all from the ground up. And uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat courageous thing to do in the, in the public space because the failure rate for early stage companies is high. It's upwards of 90%. And the number that get exits is minuscule. And yet we've been um, able to, through hard work and some good, good fortune, uh, we've been able to build four companies that have been able to overcome the slings and arrows of being an early stage business, get to positive uh, revenue generation, build a bulwark around their intellectual property, and uh, two of which were able to find exits into the capital markets uh, in a fairly short time frame. Our first company was Belluscura, which most, most of you will know. Uh, they, they make a very... Um, um, advanced portable oxygen concentrator that's modular. It was FDA cleared, first modular portable oxygen concentrator in the world to be FDA cleared, which is quite an achievement for an early stage business. And uh, they subsequently listed about a year ago, and uh, they're doing quite well. They're producing products and getting them to customers, and uh, we're very excited about their, their future potential. And we're, we're, of course, the largest shareholder of them, uh, even though we've lightened up slightly uh, in the last few months. Uh, and uh, that's a good example. And that took about four years from start, uh, which is less than half of the average, according to the American Venture Capital Association. Seven to 10 years is the sort of the range for startup to exit. So uh, we're either doing something right or we're being quite fortunate. Either way, uh, that's, that's what has happened. The second company, Lucid, which really began in uh, Innovative Eyewear, which is its U.S. operating business, really began in 2019, did a listing, uh, you know, this past summer. And uh, that was very exciting. It was on the NASDAQ, extremely difficult to do in this climate. But we, we keep our head down and keep plowing forward. And the company has built a lot of value in our view. And we were able to raise the capital it needs for its growth trajectory. And uh, we still retain 71% approximately of the, uh, of the common shares of the company post-IPO, which we're, we're thrilled to have. Uh, the third company is Guidant, which makes software for monitoring, remotely monitoring autonomous vehicles and delivery devices. And uh, they have built their first uh, remote monitoring and control center in the state of Florida. They won their first contract, thankfully, in this past May with um, a major state transportation uh, department in the state of Florida, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. 
And they just signed a letter of intent with the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, which is the largest commercial real estate campus uh, in the state of Florida. It consists of 123 acres, more than 2 million square feet of rentable space. It's really quite a remarkable center. And they just won a, uh, executed a letter of intent with the Boca Raton Innovation Campus to not only monitor a uh, autonomous shuttle that will deliver people from the train station to 11 stops throughout the campus, but also actually run the shuttle, which is sort of a step up from just monitoring the shuttle. They're, they're running the shuttle and monitoring it, which is really a, quite an achievement. And that'll begin uh, in 2023. More on that in a few moments. And then uh, finally, we also established Microsalt to help make a dent in cardiovascular disease. Uh, Microsalt owns a patented process for producing what we believe to be the world's smallest edible salt crystals. It's about 100 times smaller than table salt. And uh, that company is making very good progress, which we'll talk about in a few moments. And we're seeking to list that company in H1 2023. And in fact, we're doing a, a beauty parade as we speak. Uh, speaking with a number of um, uh, nominated advisors, brokers, about uh, potentially listing it uh, early in 2023 uh, on the uh, London AIM market. So th these are these four companies are the fruits of this whole process that we built from the ground up for culling sort of diamonds in the rough from the world's leading research institutions, selecting those that we think have promise and actually sort of eating our own cooking by investing in them, hiring uh, very high level team me members to operate these businesses. And that also, I, I just want to underscore that for a second. That's an important part of our investment thesis. Very often early stage businesses in our view have wonderful technology, but the early stage managers have a difficult time navigating a very complex commercial environment with strong uh, incumbents that don't want to give up their positions easily. And so we feel to one of the important features to mitigate failure risk for early stage businesses is to engage proven senior managers that can be dropped into those businesses that have done it before, that have built, in most cases, billion dollar plus enterprises and run them. And a good example is in the case of Guidant, uh, the CEO we selected for Guidant, which was a clean sheet startup, was Harold Braun, who uh, was the CEO of Siemens Nokia, which is one of the largest tech companies in the United States uh, in, in that space, in the, in the broadband space. And uh, they had 4,000 employees. So he ran a business of that size with good results. So it, was, it was a wonderful example of taking a an experienced pair of hands and using that individual to find a path through the market for this early stage technology company. And it's, and it's going extraordinarily well. And I would imagine it would not have gone so well had the manager we selected been a little less annealed uh, to the vesictitudes of the marketplace. So uh, that's what we're about. Um, and Belliscura, we've already covered it uh, sort of briefly. They, they have a, a modular portable oxygen concentrator, which allows you to cost effectively upgrade the device by sweeping out the, uh, the filter cartridge uh, as the person's disease progresses. Because there's no cure for COPD, uh, unfortunately, you know, chronic emphysema and bronchitis, the disease tends to progress. Nevertheless, the patients can still do well if they could also progress the amount of, of supplemental oxygen they receive. And that usually requires a bigger portable oxygen concentrator, but not so with Belliscura's Explorer product, uh, which can be upgraded by the user by putting in a, a higher capacity filter cartridge. And that means more people will be able to afford portable oxygen concentrators that desperately need them. And so uh, that's the, uh, the long contribution that this company can make. Uh, and uh, we think uh, they have uh, the tools to uh, earn a piece of this billion-dollar business. Lucid uh, is based on the premise of eyewear being needed to be upgraded. 
the eyewear business in the, is a huge business worldwide. Uh, in in the in the states alone, it's it's around thirty billion dollars. But the eyewear business is very stodgy. It's ripe for disruption. The frames of glasses haven't changed much, believe it or not, in nearly six hundred years. The, the lenses have improved dramatically with photochromic lenses, multifocal point lenses, with better lens materials. Um, but the actual frames themselves, even the ones I'm wearing, were available, you know, in the 1600s. Oh, they may have been made out of bone or wood instead of cellulose acetate, but I think that's just a commentary. The reality is they haven't, they've managed to avoid, the frames of eyewear have managed to avoid almost all of the technological revolutions that have impacted positively many other consumer product companies. So innovative eyewear, which is Lucid's operating business, is set about to change that, to upgrade your eyewear. And in fact, they own that slogan. It's a registered trademark of the company. And the upgrade is about taking the eyewear and uh, putting in Bluetooth technology that allows you to take and make calls, listen to music, talk to Siri, Google Voice, Alexa, Bixby, or any other digital assistant, call an Uber, send cash through the cash app, send an email, all hands-free through your glasses. And the glasses look, look like normal glasses. Not only do they look like normal glasses, they also weigh like normal glasses, which is just about an ounce which is an amazing feat of engineering in our view. Battery lasts all day, which is important because you can't take your glasses off if you wear them all day like I do at three in the afternoon to have to recharge them. It's, and um, they also need to be priced the same. And the glasses I'm wearing, which are, are from Lucid, uh, they're $149 with sunglass lenses, a little more if you want to put in a prescription lens. Uh, so they're the same price as the low-end designer glasses. So Lucid has achieved something by making the first pr proper prescription glasses available that are Bluetooth enabled. And they've learned a lot and they've produced now, they have 19 different styles and they've produced a number of firsts in the industry. In fact, they're coming out um, uh, with, in Q1 with uh, quadraphonic sound in the glasses. There'll be four speakers in the glasses, same form factor as the ones I'm wearing. So you really have surround sound in the glasses, four speakers, two microphones, two chipsets, two batteries, and they still weigh about an ounce, which is an amazing achievement in our view and not expensive. So we think most uh, eyewear purchases in the future will be for enhanced or smart eyewear. And, it, and the best analogy for this business is really... Um, in our view, the uh, uh, the smartwatch business. You know, the smartwatch business basically came out of nowhere. People sort of dismissed it as unnecessary. <clears throat> and um, now the smartwatch business uh, produces between 100 and 150 million units a year. They trade, uh, normally they sell between 200 and $400 a piece. The business is growing at a compound annual growth rate of about 20, 23%. Uh, Apple's smart watch business is over $10 billion. It's funny, I was speaking to an executive at Apple who said, yeah, the, the business is going hand over fist, the smart watches. And she was sort of joking with me. And she said, I don't think anyone buys our smart watches to tell time. By the way, <laughs> they, want, they want to be told other things. They want notifications. Well, by golly, you can get those notifications through the glasses. And they're a lot closer. You don't have to look away which is important if you're running or jogging or driving or doing something you need to focus on. Uh, and uh, this was, a, this was the, uh, the nice privilege that uh, Innovative Eyewear had when they, uh, they closed the, uh, the NASDAQ uh, stock exchange. Um, they were invited to go which, where they're currently listed. So, uh, yeah, so smart eyewear, we think, is the future of eyewear. And, and it's interesting, again, that finally on this uh, smartwatch analogy, um, you know, Timex and Rolex and Swatch didn't become the leading smart smartwatch companies. Apple did. Samsung did. The tech companies did. So it's it's a really interesting shift. And, 
uh, over the next couple of years, it's our view that the watch business will be smart watch business. There'll be a small traditional watch business because watches are also sold as jewelry items, of course. And we think that may well be the case for a foreseeable future. But the majority, the big part of the watch business, we think will be the smart watch business. And we think the same exact thing is going to happen with the eyewear business. And so we're, we're going to, uh, to earn a piece of that, 1% of that, which would make Innovative Eyewear a very successful company. So Guided makes software for monitoring uh, vehicles, and, but it not only enables you to monitor autonomous vehicles and delivery devices, it enables you to take over control of them if they get into Dutch or, or they get out of control. And uh, the technology is not simple to get it right. And it's all about being able to see what, what the vehicle is seeing in a remote monitoring center, maybe tens of miles or even hundreds of miles away. And Guided has developed this technology, licensed a number of patents, developed a number of patents. They have eight patents now. And they actually have written many thousands of lines of code and uh, built interfaces. And they actually have a working remote monitoring and control center in Boca Raton, Florida. And as I mentioned briefly, uh, they just signed a letter of intent with the Boca Raton Innovation Campus, which is a 123 acre campus to operate the shuttle service that goes across that campus from the train station to all of the buildings in that campus. And that will start in 2023, which is a ter terrific win for the company. It's also the law in the state of Florida and in many other states since Florida passed the law uh, that if you wanna operate autonomous vehicles or autonomous shuttles, which you're able to do in the state of Florida legally, you have to have either a safety driver or you have to be able to hook them up to a remote monitoring and control center. So these autonomous shuttles uh, don't have safety drivers. Uh, sort of what's the point? If you're going to have a safety driver, you might as well not have an autonomous shuttle, just have a traditional shuttle. But if you want an autonomous shuttle and you want the benefits of the autonomy, which is the lower cost of operation, uh, it, you don't have a safety driver, which means you have to hook them up to a remote monitoring and control center. And Guidant has built the first remote monitoring and control center, to our knowledge, in the state of Florida and perhaps in the U.S. And not only is it a first, it has what we believe, what they believe, more importantly, is the lowest latency of any remote monitoring and control capability that's been publicly disclosed. And it, it's... It's, it's around 35 milliseconds. So that's, that's called the glass-to-glass -glass latency. It's the time it takes the signal to get from uh, the vehicle to the remote monitoring center. So that's a bit of the art, and they've been able to do that. They also have developed a, uh, a new shock absorber based on a technology acquired by the Research Foundation, acquired from the Research Foundation at the State University of New York that allows you to convert the bumps that a car normally feels in its shock absorbers to additional energy to recharge the battery to extend the range of the vehicle. And uh, they've been prototyping these uh, shock absorbers and they're actually working quite well. They finally got it right. It really looks like uh, this could be an extremely useful uh, device to have in electric vehicles, autonomous or otherwise. Right now, every uh, major electric vehicle has regenerative braking, where the, uh, the friction from the braking is used, that energy is used to recharge the battery, to extend the range of the vehicle. Everyone, every electric vehicle basically has that now. We believe, this is a prediction, we believe every electric vehicle in the future will also have regenerative shock absorbers. So all the heat energy generated from the shock absorbers will also go to recharging uh, the battery and extending the range of the vehicles. And um, uh, we've been testing this with a number of uh, very large companies who are very excited about it in our view. And we're hoping to make some progress on working with one or more of those companies uh, in, in the uh, subsequent periods. By the way, if you're wondering why they got into this area, uh, they, they thought initially that when they were 
when they had the technology and the vehicles for taking the signals and, and transmitting them to the remote monitoring center, they thought it might be power consumptive. And so they wanted a device that could generate additional power in the vehicle sort of to make it power neutral. That was the original thing. As it turns out, it's not that power consumptive. So that wasn't the issue. But the device itself, uh, the manufacturers are very keen about this, electric vehicle manufacturers. There's a race to extend the range. There's also a race going on in the electric vehicle industry to make as, as green an electric vehicle as possible for obvious reasons. And so these um, regenerative shock absorbers actually achieve both. It makes the vehicle greener and it extends the range. Very nice. It's a nice improvement in our view. And then last but certainly not least is Microsalt. Microsalt, if you had to say it in a nutshell, is, is gunning to make a dent in cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of premature death. Um, you know, roughly 17.9 uh, million people die from cardiovascular disease each year. It's the number one cause of death and suffering from a medical problem, according to the World Health Organization and many other health organizations. And the number one contributive factor and controllable factor is excess sodium consumption. And so that's the business that Microsalt is in. There, it's a, it's a low sodium salt substitute, but unlike 99.9% .9 of the salt substitutes out there today, uh, which work, but don't taste good, this is all, Microsalt substitute is all natural, non-GMO, and it's made from sodium chloride, not potassium chloride, not MSG, or any other chemical combination. It's really uh, salt. It tastes like salt. It just allows you to have the full flavor of salt with less sodium because the particle size is so small, it dissolves quickly on the tongue, and it basically makes the brain feel like it's saltier than it actually is. So you need to use less. And so they, they've exper ex uh, experimented with as proof of concept to put it on crisps, which have gone very well, which are in a couple thousand stores now throughout uh, the United States. Uh, they recently uh, got a contract with a prepared food company in France uh, to put it in the prepared food. And this company says it doesn't affect the flavor in any negative way whatsoever. And it reduces the sodium by 70% in those prepared foods that you heat up in your microwave. And then recently, the end of September, we announced that they had launched microsalt and containers. And uh, these were taken into distribution by Unified, the largest natural food distributor in the United States. And we just heard recently that uh, a regional chain in, in the Northeast, just under 200 stores, will be onboarding the product shortly. So we think these microsalt salt containers will be sold in supermarkets and stores around the states and then ultimately around the world and in hospitals and universities and schools and uh, restaurants, any place that a person may want to put salt on a, on a meal, uh, this is a, a lower sodium way to do it. So it's, what's really nice about this company is if it's, if it's successful long term, it could really make a dent in cardiovascular disease and save lives as well as produce significant returns on invested capital. The current market for, for low sodium salt is one and a half billion dollars and it's mostly potassium chloride, which doesn't taste good. So the Microsalt product really is a disruptor to the low sodium industry. So actually, is, in our view, it's a disruptor to the salt industry. It's really a better salt, not just a better low sodium salt. It's way better low sodium salt. It's just a better salt. So we're very excited about the business, excited about the management team. Rick Gooney's the CEO. He's really a prince of a gentleman. He's very knowledgeable, uh, very capable gent. He ran a snack food business for over 30 years. That was part of the Inc. 500. And uh, he's taking this business from strength to strength. And as I mentioned earlier, we're planning to list it in H1 of 2023. Uh, fingers crossed. And we should, in the near future, uh, announce our decision when we complete our beauty parade of the uh, our advisors uh, that we're selecting to help us achieve that.
And that's basically it in a nutshell. We commercialize university discoveries that hopefully can make a positive impact on people's lives and produce a good return on invested capital for our shareholders. And I'm delighted to take any questions you may have. Certainly some of, some of those uh, coming through. Um, so this was actually a question for the previous speaker, but well, of course you'll have a very different answer, but um, how are market conditions affecting IPO timing? And someone's asked here specifically, has Microsoft's IPO been pushed back? Well, not to be arrogant in any way, shape or form, we don't think it's going to affect our ability to get the deal done. Is it a tough market? Of course it is. <laughs> it's a terrible capital market, but that's not going to stop us. We just, you know, we're resolved to do it. And our goal is to get, and our job is to get it done. Uh, because the customers are coming now to Microsoft and they want to be able to purchase millions of pounds of the salt in multiple territories. And they want to make sure that our supply chain could stand the test of what they need. So it's going to be about large quantity production because salt is purchased in huge quantities by major food companies around the world. So we have to strengthen Microsoft so it has the ability to deliver this so it can become a leading player in the low sodium salt industry worldwide. And so to do that, uh, we're gonna access, uh, you, know, you know, public investment capital. And uh, therefore we're going to take the company public. And, you know, even in tough markets, companies go public. It's just not as many as in good markets. Yeah, and I think, you know, on a larger level, we saw such an exuberant market that, you know, there was so many of them. Went, um, but are you planning to IPO it in the US or in, in, in the UK? Um, and just to broaden out that, that question a bit, you know, when you're, what, what sort of factors do you look at when you're weighing up basically where and which, which uh, index to choose, which market to choose? Yeah. Uh, the answer to the first part of that question is uh, our, our intention is to list Microsoft in 2023 in the United Kingdom and probably on the AIM market. And uh, we think it's a great market for a number of reasons. Uh, and we also think food companies are well understood and well appreciated and well valued in the United Kingdom. And uh, we think uh, you know, one out of three UK adults has high blood pressure. <laughs> you don't have to look far to find people that have high blood pressure in your house, in your family, in your neighborhood. Uh, it's worse in the US, by the way. 47% of US adults have high blood pressure. It's a silent killer. A lot of people die from cardiovascular disease from high blood pressure. My grandfather did, had a massive coronary died on the spot. Many people do, unfortunately. So we think uh, the UK market is a perfectly good market uh, for uh, listing Microsoft. We think it'll achieve a good valuation over time based on its performance, not on hype, and based on the need for the product. And right now, it's really interesting. But as I mentioned, uh, about a billion and a half dollars of low sodium salt substitutes are sold each year. And they, they don't taste good. <laughs> they don't taste good, not because I'm being critical of the competition. I'm, I'm just kind of reporting the news. They don't taste good because of the mostly potassium chloride, and potassium chloride is a metal, and where it resides in particular as a metal on the periodic table gives it a very bitter taste. Mm -hmm. And you can't really, sw you can't talk yourself around that. You, you can try to mask it, but the yeah. tongue is exquisitely sensitive to metallic. That would have been a, a great question for our polls function. We could have asked the audience how many... Uh agree with that but uh, perhaps next time we'll have to uh, put that future sure. market research for you okay but sorry uh, sorry carry on yeah so uh, so we think uh, the uk is a wonderful market for it and which market you choose you know for listing these companies uh you know we don't have a large sample size so i don't want to generalize from our experience but a lot has to do with with the network that we have you know we we know a number of investment banks in the uk and in the us and uh, if we have good receptivity from our bankers to do a transaction in this climate, you know, that's, that obviously weighs on our decision, but also the receptivity of the marketplace to, uh, to improve foods, uh, to imp foods with improved nutritional profiles, uh, where that re receptivity is, I think, uh, 
uh, is also an important part of the decision. But I think the UK market is good for this. It's and, and it's an, it's it's also a bit less expensive than doing a listing uh, in the US for uh, for a number of reasons, which may be obvious to uh, some of the listeners. So uh, uh, we we've selected the UK for this particular product. Mm, excellent. Um, and uh, a question here about so someone says I've noticed that the salt meat potato chips have not been available in Kroger or Amazon for a few weeks now. Um, I don't know if that implies, by the way, that they themselves are a, a customer, if it's just something they keep an eye on. Um, but uh, do you know if production is keeping up with demand? Uh, as far as I know, um, they are still available, and they're being sold in, you know, in thousands of locations. Um, but, uh, you know, it, one, of the, one of the challenges of, of young companies when they do have a success on their hands is to, you know, keep up with the production demands. And um, one of the things that uh, we hope to achieve with the company after it's public is we want the company to build its own manufacturing operations to make uh, the micronized salt, uh, not the crisp, but the micronized salt uh, in the U.S. And then a second facility later on in the UK and in other principal markets, which is in a sense the King Coleman, the soy sauce company model. King Coleman, which is a really well-run company. It's one of the oldest companies in the world. It's 400 years old, actually. Uh, it's a listed company. Uh, and uh, they have uh, manufacturing operations in upwards of 90 countries and warehousing operations. So they're a local supplier in their major markets. And we think over time, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but we think over time Microsoft will need to do that as well because the supply chains are very rigorous for this commodity. You know, when you're supplying a snack food company or a prepared food company or even a distribution company into supermarkets or the salt shakers, you have to deliver the product on a very precise time frame and it often necessitates local manufacturing. And then it also allows you to preserve your margins reduce any import duties and in, in a business that even though we have patent protection it's considered sort of a commodity type of product as a salt, salt ingredient uh, you want to preserve the margins as much as possible so um, as far as we know salt is available micro salt is available we're shipping salt shakers we're shipping uh, salt meat crisps and we will continue to do so Great. And it's, I think it's the last Microsoft, Microsoft question before we move on to the uh, sure. others. Um, uh, was there a plan to release salt shakers onto the market? A questioner here seems to remember that that was something that was penciled in from, uh, for October. Um, what's the latest on that? Yeah, we have. You see the in the upper yeah. left-hand corner here? Is that in the UK? I think they mean in the, U, in the UK. Oh, in the UK. Yeah, we are working. Uh, they're already being distributed in the US. And... Uh, it should, they should be in, in, all, in upwards of 200 stores by uh, uh, Q1 in the U.S., which is good considering it was just launched like 70 days ago, right? Yeah. Uh, as a new, as a total new product category, it's the first all-natural non-GMO low sodium sodium chloride available anywhere. Um, but yes, to answer your question about the U.K., um, we've recently announced we've onboarded Judith Bachelor who is a uh, remarkable uh, executive in our view. She's been in the um, food industry for 35 years. She's an OBE. She was on the board of Sainsbury and uh, uh, prior to that, at Marks and Spencer. And uh, what's well, interesting at Sainsbury, she was not just, she wasn't an NED. She was, you know, an executive director and her, her job, one of her jobs was the formulation or the reformulation of the food products to improve their nutritional profile. She's a nutritionist by training. Mm. And uh, uh, so we're, we're, we're delighted to have her. And uh, one, part, one of her uh, responsibilities is to rapidly accelerate the introduction of Microsoft products, including the shakers, into the UK. And they're working on it as we speak. And uh, I think there's some good excitement around that, actually. Can't tell you any more than that. Yeah, perhaps next time, or well, well, perhaps we'll see it before we before we hear it. You know. um, excellent. Um, so on to Gaiden here. Um, sure. The questioner asks: Have you had any meaningful discussions with major automate 
major automakers about using Gaiden? Yeah, well, the uh, right, the Guidance initial customers are not the, for the remote monitoring and control service, are not major automakers right now. The initial customers are municipalities and, and uh, real estate companies that want to run uh, autonomous vehicles. And they're, and they're on a um, sort of a predetermined uh, path, you know, a well-known path, like, you know, almost like bus stops, you know. And so their first customer was the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, and they run shuttles, men operated, men and women operated shuttles, and, and they want to make them autonomous, and they want to use a guide to remotely monitor them to enhance the safety. And then the brick uh, facility, which is the largest real estate uh, office facility in the state of Florida, over 123 acres of office buildings, uh, they have a shuttle that's that's human operated and they want that to be autonomous and so guidance will be operating that shuttle as well as monitoring it and so the early business that they're able to win are these sort of predetermined route shuttles and there's a good reason for that they're safer the uh you can predict the problems better so you can solve the problems better um uh, you could you could have a, uh, a private LTE network, which has a lower latency than the public 5G networks, the public Wi-Fi networks, so they're more accurate. So what, what people are seeing in the remote monitoring center is very close to real time what the vehicles are seeing in front of them as they as they meander on their on their paths, their ring fence paths. So that's the that's the current market. In the future, we think. You know, all vehicles uh, will be autonomous, or most vehicles will be autonomous, whether they're people movers for municipalities or real estate properties or personal vehicles. But right now, the we think the business is on the uh, the ring fenced uh, municipality and similar like applications, and also uh, we we think there's there's a good business to be one right now for the product delivery businesses, the people that are delivering products from the Walmarts, the Domino pizzas of the world to people's homes. And the reason why that's uh, coming on board on stream, it's, it's happening a lot in the States now, uh, is that those delivery devices tend to be smaller and they, and they tend to go at 25 miles an hour or less. And as you know from your early physics classes, momentum is mass times velocity. So if your mass is less and your velocity is less, the momentum, which is the damage that you could do to a biped or, you know, physical objects in the environment is less. So they're inherently safer. And it's also quicker to be able to get them out of harm's way because they're moving slower. So, uh, so the remote monitoring customers, we think, will be in the ring-fenced municipal applications early on and in the product delivery applications. Those are the logical sort of first movers in the autonomous vehicle space. And then eventually it'll be the large trucks and the passenger vehicles, et cetera, robo taxis, which Uber is ex experimenting with right now in, in uh, Las Vegas, et cetera. Yeah, so, um, and there's a question about Lucid as well, about whether um, whether that particular business will need more capital, capital to be raised. It's obviously very ambitious venture so are you looking to raise more capital in the future most early stage businesses public or private if they're successful want to raise more capital <laughs> and that's not a bad thing that's not like a character flaw i mean that's that's table stakes if you want to if you want to grow a significant technologically advanced company of course you need to access more capital to bring in new products to to uh, expand the staff to operate the business in different and additional territories. So yeah, in the future, I would think that would be the case. Thankfully, currently, Innovative Eyewear has the resources it needs to execute its plan. Uh, and uh, they're doing a lot of wonderful things. I mean, you think about it. I mean, the glasses I'm wearing are their product and I'm talking to you over Zoom, but there's no, you know, there's no uh, uh, earbuds, <laughs> and no wires because uh, I'm, 
not only do the glasses connect to your phone, they can also connect to any Bluetooth enabled device. They, they can connect to your smartwatch or they can connect to your laptop or your desktop. Mm. And uh, so it's really nice. It's a wonderful product, actually. And, and uh, they have over 600 five star ratings. And once people start using smart eyewear, it's like there's no going back. You don't go and say, oh, I want, a, I want the traditional dumb stuff, you know, and I don't especially if it looks good and it's it's cost effective and we've hired some really uh, i should say we not we they have hired some really uh, in our view remarkable designers who were designing major fashion brands to design the next generation of product and as you know we announced we um they licensed the nautica uh, brand uh, for smart eyewear uh, worldwide for multiple years and so nautica will be the first fashion brand with uh, smart smart eyewear fashion brand and that's very exciting because a lot of people like to buy uh you know designer brands when they buy their eyewear uh, and so we're looking at licensing potentially additional designer brands uh, to expand the um, the stable of uh, product categories that uh innovative eyewear can make available to optical re resellers and other channels around the world. Yeah, the, the innovative eyewear business has the potential. I'm not just saying this loosely. I mean, and it's, you know, it's not a guarantee that it will happen, but they have the potential of really disrupting the eyewear business. And, and they don't have to take it over to disrupt it. Even if they earn 1% of it, <laughs> they could become a very significant sized business. And remember, eyewear is the most important wearable in the world. You know, two thirds of the world need corrective lenses to see properly. And most people need sunglasses at some point during the year, if not all the time, depending upon the climate that you live in. Uh, so, uh, you know, while the, the, the watch business and the smart watch business is growing by leaps and bounds, the eyewear business is much larger than the watch business. Mm -hmm. It's much more important wearable in the in the, uh, in the hierarchy, the food chain. I agree with you there. Um, so lastly, let, let's talk kind of the future. Um, so questions asked: Are there, you know, I obviously, well, perhaps you aren't. Are, are you on the lookout for more opportunities to add to this portfolio of four companies? And you know, broadly, what's the process of, of doing that? Do you find that the doors are always open in these great universities across? North America and Europe, or, you know, do you have to do a bit of kind of a sharp elbow and get in there first? So, yeah, we'd love to hear about your kind of acquisition uh, pipeline and process. Yeah. In a way, um, we've learned to say no, <laughs> which mm. is a, an important skill to have in this business. You have to be very selective, extremely sagacious. Look, uh, a countryman of yours said it perfectly. Discretion is the better part of valor. Right. And it still is the case, even in technology transfer. Um, that being said, we would love to do additional projects and we have them presented to us all the time. It's really a buyer's market. Buying carefully, though, is a bit of an art, as, as we've discussed. So, uh, yes, we, we are looking at multiple technology acquisition opportunities, but we will not pull the trigger until the four that we have are all uh, sort of safely on their way. To achieving their goals, which we hope, you know, will be in the, in the very near future. You know, two of them have, uh, you know, entered the capital markets. A third, hopefully, will do so in, in H1 of 2023. And then next would be guidance. And we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to add uh, some additional uh, vibrant technology acquisition opportunities uh, to the portfolio in the future. But we're not doing it today. We're staying focused, and you need to be focused. You know, companies fail for lots of reasons, but focus is not one of them.